This is Cerebral Cinema. Movies of the Mind. It's the Rocky Jordan Show. And I'm Rocky Jordan. We take you now to Cairo in the Cafe Tambourine for a world of adventure with Rocky Jordan. Perhaps you already know that the Nile Valley is one of the most fertile spots on earth. Everything grows there. Trouble, religious fanatics, cotton, a girl named Farada. Yes, and there's an end product to all this growth and life. To some it comes slowly, but to others it comes quickly and unexpected. It's a thing called death. The Café Tambourine, crowded with tourists, camel drivers, women, cheats, forgotten men down on their luck, the lonely and the lost. For this is Cairo, gateway to the ancient east, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against a backdrop of antiquity. Tonight's Rocky Jordan story, The Nile Runs High. Winter and summer come to Egypt like any other land. But there's only one other season of the year, and the most important of the three. It comes as the great river Nile rises to overflow its banks in late September, bringing new fertility and life to this strange land. The Nile season is a time for rejoicing and festivities. And I was out in the morning to watch the myriad white sailboats sporting on the river. I wandered alone away from the holiday crowd, south past the Ismail Bridge. Finally, just as I decided it was time to get back to the tambourine, a white sailed scow caught my eye, moving away from the other boats and seemingly out of hand. It heeled into the wind, then a breeze swung it directly toward shore, and it kept coming till it floundered to ground. A voice moved me into action. Help me! In the name of Allah, help me! I splashed out into the shallow water and in a few seconds climbed onto the listing deck. I ducked under the boom toward where a man lay helpless across the tiller. He wore the blue robes of the native fellaheen. They were splotched with red. Oh, my my good All right, easy, fella. You're hurt bad. Oh, What's it all about? I did my best. Tell my master. That chauffeur did his best. It looks like a bullet wound. Who did it? I do not know. They were in another boat. All right now, we got to get help. Oh, no, no, no. There is no time. Take it back now. Quickly offend me. Take what back? What do you mean? There. There below. Take it back. Shufa was pointing frantically to the open hatch, so I hurried over and down to the small cabin. It was loaded with miniature bales of cotton. I touched one and found that it was wet. But what interested me was the man on deck, so I got back to him. Too late. Shufa had rolled over on the deck, face up. Dead now from the bullet wound in his chest. <laughs> Well, it wasn't a pleasant way to start the day. I threw a piece of sail over the pathetic figure and dropped an anchor to secure the boat where it was. I scratched around a little but found no papers to identify the boat. All I could find was its name painted on the side, the Water Nymph. After that, I waded ashore, and about three blocks up the hill, I found a phone booth outside a little market. Police headquarters, Sabaya speaking. Hello, Sam. It's Rocky. Jordan. Why are you not out celebrating with the rays? The Nile runs high. This is no time Now, just for... listen, Sam. I've got a report. I do not like the sound of your voice, Jordan. Neither do I. But here it is. There's a sail scow near the foot of Sharia Bendur, grounded a little offshore. Indeed. And how should that interest me? A couple of things, maybe. For one, a load of cotton. Most interesting. And what else? You'll find a man lying on deck, shot to death. So that is it. Jordan, why is it that always you are... I hold the question, Sam. I'll give you all I know when you show up. Very well, George. You will wait for me there. No. I opened the door to leave, and I got a lot of help. A powerful brawny arm reached in and dragged me out. We will talk, Englazy. All right. Start saying something. You made the phone call. Who was it with? I got the wrong number. <coughs> Shadrach is a man of impatience. Uh, as my friend Jabba here says, you were seen to board the boat on the river. Tell us what you saw there. A little cotton? A dead man? Maybe you killed? <coughs> Shadrach is a man of anger. Perhaps the knife will loosen your tongue. Uh, use it and see what you find out. 
Speak now. What the dead man told you, and what you have told others. And if I don't? Then, Englazy, you will quickly join the unfortunate boatman. Wait, wait, Shadrach. Huh? Look who comes. There were five of them, their dirty white robes flapping in the wind. The leader was waving a sword with a double-edged blade. In the name of Kahira, Shadrach and his buddy froze for a split second, and just before they ran, they slammed me headfirst at the feet of the onrushing pack. Jolt knocked the wind out of me. Somebody's boot behind my left ear did the rest. That was all. When I opened my eyes, I saw bare sandstone walls and light coming in a high window. The rest I saw made me sure I was dreaming. But the soft hand stroking my cheeks was still there, so I looked again. The face bending over me was beautiful, but expressionless. She was dark, not too slender. The only sign she was human was the throbbing at her temples until she spoke. You need not fear. We are both quite safe. Are we, lady? What happened to all the little men? They do not matter now. They brought you here, and now we are alone. Yeah, real cozy. Lie quietly. The pain will soon be gone. That's not what bothers me. <laughs> My name is Farada. And you'd like to know mine. You are Rocky Jordan. You own a cafe called The Tambourine, and you are an American. The huh. card in my billfold says that. But when a woman meets a man, she wishes to know more of him, does she not? Yeah, sure she does. You do not look like one who brawls in the street. The two strong men were most violent with you. Would you not like to tell me why? What makes you think I got anything to tell? I see to your rescue, and yet you question. Everybody's got some angle. I do not understand. Maybe yours is a boat down on the river, a load of wet cotton, and a dead man who might have said something that I told somebody else on the phone. Very well. You need only tell me. You get quite an assignment getting information out of me in your own way. I think I like Shadrach's way better. Why? Is it that you could resist his way, but not mine? Give it up, lady. It won't work. A man as wise as you should know that my way is best. Where's the threat from? El Cahira? Then you know of him. One of your boys shouted his name. Who is he? El Cahira is a man of destiny. The true, the exalted leader. I'm still asking who he is. Very soon you and all Egypt will know. Only those who bend to his will shall be spared. Well, maybe he'll spare me till he knows what I told other people. Perhaps. Believe me, then? <laughs> you got ways of stopping me? I would not use them. Mr. Jordan. Yeah? Go anywhere but to the police. My men can return most quickly. I went out and down some steps to what turned out to be one of Cairo's many old deserted towers. I knew I wouldn't find Farada there again. If any of my rescuers were around outside, they didn't show their faces. So I skipped Farada's advice and made it for police headquarters the quickest way. When I walked into Sabaya's office, he jumped up from behind his desk and came striding toward me. Jordan, where have you been? I have been worried about me, Sam. We will leave my personal feelings out of this, if, if that is possible. Uh, suit yourself. I don't feel so good either. Listen to me, Jordan. Was it not you who phoned me two hours ago most urgently? In person. And did you not say that you would join me at the foot of the Sharia Bendo where it meets the river? Well, that was my plan. And did you not say that a boat was anchored there, loaded with cotton, and with a dead man on its deck? That's all straight. Did you get there, Sam? I did. Well, have a look inside those cotton bales. Got a hunch you'll find something there. Jordan. Yeah? There is an old saying of my people. Perhaps you have heard it. No, I can take it again. It is said, a man who is bitten by a serpent will be frightened by the sight of a rope. Where does that fit? You, an adventurer, have seen violence and death often. Is it not possible that in a moment of, shall we say, celebration, what you saw was not real? Take a look at these bruises, Sam. They're real. They prove nothing. So what are you driving at? I will tell you. It so happens that when I got there, there was no cotton. Also, there was no dead man. In fact, Jordan, there was not even a boat. Sam Sabaya sat watching what he just told me sink in. The sailboat, its small cargo of cotton, and the lifeless man at the tiller were gone, all vanished. Or, as Sam put it, they were never there. I had to make him believe me. Sam, what I told you on the phone was all true. Please, Jordan, do not try my patience. Now get this, all of it. Right after I hung up, a couple of bearded characters started working me over. They wanted to know what I might have found or heard on that boat. And what might that be? I don't know. The boatman tried to say something about the cotton. Uh, 
Continue, Jordan. Now, just as the two bearded men got rough, a gang of desert rats charged in. There was a free-for-all with me in the middle. I went out for the count and woke up in a deserted tower with a dame named Farada. She tried to dig some information, too. <laughs> you have had quite a day. Oh, listen, will you, Sam? The desert gang and Farada were taking orders from somebody they call El Cahira. El Cahira. Is that quite everything, Jordan? Well, up to now, it is. There'll be plenty more. Jordan, let me suggest that you go back to your cafe and have a good sleep. I trust that you will not need an escort. I wasn't sure how much of my story Sam believed. All I knew was he bit his tongue at the mention of El Cahira, and there must have been a reason. Outside, I hadn't gone ten steps when I spotted Farada in a doorway across the street. A couple of more white-robed shadows planted a few doors down. I stepped it up, and when I saw they were following, I took cover in a bar half a block down. Hey, Rocky, come on over. It was an old friend seated alone near the door, Bill Harder, crack reporter for the Cairo Mail. I figured he could help me, so I joined him. He was a couple of drinks ahead of me. Man, what happened to your face, Rocky? Somebody step on it? Supposing I said somebody did. <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me the scrapes you get into. Hey, give me a scoop on the next one, will you? Sure. Next time I mix with El Cahira, I'll let you know. Oh, I wouldn't wish that on you. Hey, Gus, take care of my friend here. Uh, short beer's off. Oh, by the way, El Cahira means something, doesn't it? The, uh, Victorious? Yeah, that's right. It's the original name of Cairo. Named after the planet Cahir. It's the Egyptian name for Mars. And this El Cahira appropriated the name for himself. Yeah, talk about delusions of grandeur. He's got it. Hey, what brought him up? You did. I did? <laughs> well, maybe so. I need somebody like him around. I haven't had a decent story in weeks. Yeah, yeah, I'm paying. Oh, thanks. And what's this El Cahira like, Bill? Well, he's a screwball to end them all, Rocky. Pretender to the throne of Egypt. You got any reasons? Oh, sure. Claims he's a direct descendant of the first king of Egypt way back about, oh, 16, oh, no, 6,000 years. You know, I think he really believes it. <laughs> a modern pharaoh, huh? Oh, before even the pharaohs. There's an old legend among the nomadic tribes that they were the original inhabitants of Egypt. They were dispossessed and forced to wander in the desert. And El Cahira's going to lead them back, that, eh? Yeah. There are always a few tribes around willing to make trouble, and Cahira seems to know how to stir them up. Any idea where he is now? Oh, who knows? He's been in and out of trouble for years, but he always seems to come back. Could be a dangerous man. He and his queen. Parada. Yeah. yeah. She's as screwy as he is. Hey, you going already, Rocky? Yeah. Back to your desk, Bill. May have a story for you. How's that? Hey, 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 that's not the way to the door. I want to speak to the cook. So long, Bill. I did say hello to the cook, but I had other reasons for going out the back way. Namely, Farada and her crew hanging around out front. I knew if I didn't want a lot of characters on my trail, from now on, I'd have to clear things up fast. So I quick went to the Nile boat registry office for information. In a minute, gents. I'm very busy. Well, we all are. Left alone to make out all these reports. Uh, supposing we speed it up, huh? Everybody. Everybody likes to be in a hurry. There's a sales scow uh, called the Water Nymph. Who does it belong to? Well, I just told your horses, gent, huh? I'm going to look it up. Huh? Everybody in the office goes to the Nile but me. Sure. Because I'm a Greek. Does not mean I do not like celebrations, does it? No. Uh, why was that boat again? The Water Nymph, under W. W. One. Wasp. Water Nymph. Water Nymph. Belongs to Mr. Malik. Goodbye, gent. Ah, hold it. Who's Mr. Malik? Malik Cattingros, Heliopolis Road. Oh, uh, one more thing. Has the boat been reported missing? No. Does that mean I have to make still another report? Yeah, skip it. Happy holiday, gent. It was a little after four when I went out onto the street. The crowds were swarming up from the waterfront. It was festive Cairo at its best. Limousines and camels, poshes and beggars, women in slacks and women with veils. I was just about to move on when I saw the flash in the sunlight. A knife stuck quivering inches deep in the doorpost by my head, and two fleeing figures vanished quickly into the milling crowd. I'd seen both of them in the knife before that day. It was Shadrach and his pal Jabba. Trying to follow would have wasted time, so I got to my car and honked my way out the Avenue de Lorraine and onto the Heliopolis Road. Just before sunset, I pulled in under a big sign in the outskirts of town. Malik Cotton Growers, and up a driveway to the spacious home. There, I was directed to a rambling warehouse behind. At the warehouse door, I was met by a man sporting a pencil mustache and a red face. Oh, I'm looking for Mr. Malik. Yes, I am Mr. Malik. And you? My name's Jordan. Ah. What do you want? 
I'm wondering if you had a man named Shufa working for you. Why, yes, what about him? He sent you a message. Message? He wants you to know he did his best. No, I do not understand. What uh, What are you talking about? Didn't you know? Your man's dead. What? I found him shot and dying on your boat. Oh, that's most regrettable. I did not know, Mr. Jordan. But maybe you know what it's about. Huh? No, no, no. Well, these things happen. There has been discord among my workers. A personal matter, perhaps. Did Shufa say anything more, Mr. Jordan? Well, uh, no, only he was concerned about the cargo... All I could see was some small bales of cotton in the cabin. Ah, yes. Well, that perhaps explains part of it. Stealing cotton is nothing new, but a small loss. Well, you have some left, then. <laughs> Excellent humor, Mr. Jordan. But come inside the warehouse. You shall see. Mr. Jordan, you observe. Premium Egyptian cotton ready for the world's markets. Yeah. You keep it here long? No, no. It is already being moved. See, the August harvest was over only three weeks ago, just ahead of the Nile season. I was just thinking. Yes? With so much cotton being moved and with boating events on the river, this would be a safe time to do a smuggling job inside the cotton bales. Uh, perhaps I would not know. Oh, by the way, have you been losing money in the cotton market? Why, I... That is a most personal question, Mr. Jordan. No, forget it. Thanks for the deluxe tour, Mr. Monarch. A pleasure. You were most gracious... To bring me the sad news of Shufa's death. He walked with me to my car and watched as I drove out to the main road. But I didn't go far. Just beyond the hill, I parked, took a heavy screwdriver from the car, got out and left the road, circling back. I had noticed how Mr. Malik kept steering me away from a certain padlocked door. I found an open entrance back of the warehouse. It was just a few more steps to the door I wanted in. There isn't much of a trick to break a padlock, if you know how. You just insert the screwdriver, give it a twist... And that's all. I was inside a large room. In the dim light, I could see some vats and all sorts of equipment that didn't mean anything. But stacked along the wall, I saw what I wanted. Small bales of cotton like those I'd seen on the boat. Only these were dry. I took one and broke it open. There was nothing inside. I tried some more and they were the same. I was stumped. I'd been sure it was a smuggling job. Well, if it was and there wasn't anything inside the bales, it had to be the cotton itself. I stood there rubbing my hand over it, and then I saw something. I rubbed again, harder. A phosphorescent glow followed in my hand's path, and all at once it clicked. It made sense now. Right away, I wanted more words with Mr. Malik. I started back into the main room of the warehouse, but I didn't have to go far. Malik was running wildly toward me, looking back over his shoulder. No! No, I beg you! No! No! The two shots had found their mark, and Malik stumbled, fell forward to the floor, and rolled over at my feet, face up. It didn't take a second look to see he was very dead. There in the middle of the warehouse, flanked by her men from the desert, gun in hand, stood Farada. Mr. Jordan, so still you do not forget. I'm just beginning to learn some things. I fear that now it will do you little good. That mean you're using the gun again? It is not mine to decide. Well, good girl, Farada. Still take orders from the big boy. All Egypt shall obey him soon. Yeah, I'd like to meet his majesty sometime. El Gahira comes. Arada, who is this who does not bow down before me? It is the man Jordan, my master. So, it is the foolhardy one who hesitates to tell what he knows. I'm ready to tell it now, El Kahira. Now it is too late. I can figure your tie-up with Malik. He had the cotton and he needed money, so he just decided to expand operations. He moved a lot of equipment, nitric acid and so on, into that big room and began manufacturing a high explosive. It's called gun cotton. It's a lot safer to handle while it's wet. Indeed, your tongue has been loosened. It's all there, including plenty of gun cotton. You made a good buyer for his stuff. Only what happened? Did Malik start backing down? Suddenly he was in great fear of the authorities. Did he not know that I am the law? <laughs> you got a lot to prove. The proof is in the doing. Soon, at my bidding, the legions of the desert will arise. Well, I don't have to guess where the gun cotton comes in. Consider, if you will, the effect of a few bombs strategically placed at certain dams far to the south. Dams which control the flow of the river. You're making it sound pretty big. Egypt is the Nile. The Nile is Egypt. The economy of the land will be disrupted. There will be chaos. All you're doing, El Cahira, and that makes you king. As you say. And after wandering the desert as outcast these many centuries... My people return to the land that is rightfully theirs. And you're telling me all this because I don't get to see it. Most truly spoken. 
Or rather, you have the gun. At your command, my master. Then you will raise it quickly. El Cairo! Who is without? It is the voice of Sabaya, the police. El Cairo! You are surrounded. The law charges you with murder and revolution. Will you come out peaceably? We will never yield. But, my master, we have no choice. Enough! We will fight to the end. We are as nothing before destiny. Should we fail, another will arise. You have spoken, my master. My subjects to the windows. Fight to the death. The desert men turned, and as Ferrara wavered, I saw my chance. I grabbed the gun from my hand and made for the open door. As I went out, it slammed behind me. I kept running till I landed behind a watering trough with Sam Sabaya. Down, Jordan, quickly. Watch that man, Sam. He's wild. El Caida, this is your last chance. There was no answer from inside. Sam motioned his men surrounding the building to stay covered. That's how we waited in silence for what seemed like a long time. I had an idea what would happen, and all at once it came. Even though he dies, El Cahira lives forever! With the blast, a sheet of flame rose from the roof, and all at once the big warehouse caved into an inferno. Suddenly they were all gone. El Cahira, the self-styled god of war, had died as fantastically as he had lived. Well, the minute we get back to town, I called my reporter friend Bill Harder and gave him the scoop I'd promised him. Sam kept me with him as he went about Cairo checking El Cahira's venture. Finally, we stood at the foot of the Sharia Bendur, looking into the dark across the river. It should not be difficult to understand why the boatman was killed. Ah, it all fits, Sam. Malik had lost too much money in the cotton market. And to recoup his fortune, he expanded operations making gun cotton, which is... Slightly illegal. Mm, to say the least, Jordan. He found a good buyer in El Cahira. He found out too late what Cahira was up to, and that the police were closing in. So he decided to call it off. But in the meantime, Shufa was sailing with the first delivery. Obviously, Mr. Malik sent his men here to the shore to signal Shufa to turn back. That's it. Trouble was, El Cahira had a boat following to make sure of delivery. When Shufa turned, they shot him. They picked up the boat while I was phoning you. Then both sides came after me. Mm. Well, we will find the lost cargo in good time. Shall we go, Jordan? Yeah, sure. El Cahira's no more problem. No. He chose to end his life as fantastically as he lived it. Instead of fighting, he committed suicide. Yeah, it's like Bill Harder said. He may have been screwy, but he was sure dangerous. Mm. But then, are not all power-mad people dangerous, Jordan? Uh, you're so right, Sam. I wonder about that legend, though, that says that nomads once owned Egypt. Uh, unsubstantiated by any historical fact. It's a, a, a pure fabrication. <laughs> like that boat I saw in the river, Sam? The boat. You go, oh. <laughs> Will you join me for coffee, Jordan? <laughs> This is Rocky Jordan speaking. Next week's story is about a friend of mine, my bartender, Chris. I caught him holding out on me, only I couldn't do anything about it. You see, what he was holding out wasn't money. It was information about a girl. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.
Cerebral Cinema hopes you have enjoyed this movie of the mind.